Welcome back, and as cliched as this sounds, well, I am with the legend, Sir Henry Cecil. Sir Henry, thank you so much for talking with no, me. It's a pleasure, pleasure. Well, it's been, let's start with this year. It's been such yeah. a year, hasn't it? Uh, Frankel has really uh, brought sunshine to your stable, hasn't he? Yes, he has. I mean, uh, <coughs> I've had to rely on him and a few older horses. My two years are backward, I think. He's recognized a lot, and he's done terribly well, and he's, sort of, he's a champion, Ho hopefully, of going on to be. Well, that's, that's interesting, you know. Um, the last time Khalid Abdullah had a really great champion that yeah. was Dancing Brave, that was back in 1986. He didn't train on uh, mm. to his four-year-old career. The decision yeah. to train on, how difficult was that? Well, I think, I think he's a horse that he was difficult early on. He used to you know, be a little bit free and pull and everything. And, and now he's settled down and learned how to race and everything. And um, you don't get a horse like that every day. You know? I mean, you know, it's once in a lifetime people have horses like that. And, if they're lucky. And you know, they're the bred to race and he's bred to stay on and train on and um, I'm sure he will too. I think he'll be a stronger horse next year. Another thing is sort of getting over a slightly longer trip as well. You know, he can do a mile or a mile and a quarter. Yeah? Talking about his earlier career, let's go back and remember the 2000 guineas. What were you thinking? What was going through yeah. your head when he actually came down into the dip? I thought, God, we've gone too fast. He's going to stop very suddenly. And he wasn't getting tired. He'd just been in front too long. Yeah? He began to idle. Idle a little bit, yeah. All right, let's, let's, uh, what, what's he like back at home? What's he like in the stable in the morning? No, he's good. I mean, he's sort of, he, he's quite sort of hot-blooded. I mean, he's, he's always trying to pull his rugs off and, you know, we have to be very careful what rug we put him on. And, you know, you put a sort of medium-sized rug on, you think it's a little bit cold and he decides at 10 o'clock at night that uh, he's too warm and he tries to get over his head. So, you know, we have to monitor him. You know, we do have cameras and things and, and, and change things around. He's quite, he is quite hot-blooded. I mean, he does sort of, when he, although he's very calm and he couldn't care less about anything, I mean, he'll sweat between his back legs, you know, which, you know, normally one doesn't like that in a horse. Right. You know? In his case, it's just him. I mean, he's always scratching and itching and he's just a little bit hot-blooded. You know? So, Henry, talking about your career, the option to become a trainer, it was such a long time ago, but do you remember mm. how that all happened? Well, anyway, I, mean, <coughs> I only came into the racing world. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm a bit of a freak, you know? Some, some of the racing sort of fraternity go back to the days of Fred Archer and they probably intermarried and they haven't all got withered hands but they've, they've intermarried and they're, sort of, you know, they're very close to related and everything and I'm not a racing family at all. My father was killed before I was born and my mother married a, uh, a trainer. And from there on, you know, the trials, the tribulations, I've worked with horses so I know how difficult it can be but the optimism that there's always tomorrow, is that what kept you going? Well, I, 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 I like, I mean, I went through a sort of stage when everything was sort of, you know, I had some very good times for years and years and years, and then I had five years in the doldrums, and, and you don't like to to go out and sort of has been, you know, and poor old Henry, you know. Um, so I'm always quite determined to, and I was always determined to try and get back a little bit, and things are getting much better. And if there was a formula to your success, would you be able to say what that was? Well, um, way, it's, it's a way of life, and I think I think uh, I think trainers got to be patient, you know? and the sort of horse I have, you know, that a lot of late maturing horses, you know, you've, you've got to be patient. You know? So three things, my late father-in-law, Sir Neil Mallis, always said to me, three things about training: are one is patience, two is patience, and three is patience. Well, you've always had some fine jockeys riding for you. You've had Steve Hawthorn, you've had Lester yeah. Bigot, you've mm. had some great horses as well. Uh, grooming a young rider like Tom Queeley, what's that been like? Yeah, it, it, and he's coming on very well. You know, he, he's talented and he's, he's young and um, he's going very well. You now he's getting his confidence and he's ridden, I suppose, I don't know how many Group 1 winners for me. It must be 16 or 17, I think. Uh, <clears throat> no, he's doing fine and I'm very happy. I, I like having my own jockeys. Yeah? I don't like sort of just getting the best jockey available. Cause I know if I drive a car, I get into a car I've never driven before. It takes me a little time getting used to it. And I always think that, you know, teamwork and getting used to the horse and everything makes a lot of difference. Now, compared to some of the others you've worked with, I, I've read some interviews where you've referred uh, Lycan Frankel to a horse like um, Wallow. What, what, I mean, how would you compare him to the others in your life? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I've been lucky, you know. I mean, I think sort of good horses make successful trainers and jockeys, you know. I think if I have a bad horse, I'm a bad trainer. You know, a jockey's riding bad horses and he can't take a position in the race, and he's a bad jockey. 
So, you know, you have to thank the horses, really. And I've been very lucky over the years with training for a lot of the inner breeders and that I've had some marvellous colts and fillies through my hands, you know. And they're all different distances, you know. I've had marvellous gold cup horses and derby horses and oaks fillies and guineas fillies and guineas horses and things. So, so they're, they're all different and they've all been so good to me. You, you, know, you, can't, you can't really compare. I wouldn't want to compare an Osho Sharp who won a triple crown with them. Um, a Frankel. Um, all I can say is Frankel is out of the ordinary, and um, as long as everything goes right and he stays sound, and um, there's every chance he'll be a much better horse next year. And Sir Henry Cecil, as a person outside of the world of horse racing, what is he like? What are some of the things he likes to do outside of horse racing? Work, work, work. I mean, I haven't got many hobbies. I like my garden, and I, I love shopping. I'm a compulsive shopper. My mother was, and, and so I must have sort of female hormones. Well, so most men hate. Like me, me, most me, me, men hate shopping. I mean, I'll shop in London all day long for a week. Uh, I don't mind what I'm looking for. I mean, whether I'm looking for ladies' clothes or antiques or jewellery or anything, I don't really mind. But I mean, I, I do love shopping, and, which is is rare. From I mean, I was brought up shooting. Really. And um, I've shot all my life, mm -hmm. and so that that was a hobby but I haven't done very much lately. All right, well, Sir Henry Cecil, thank you so much for your time. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to speak to the man who's well trained some great racehorses mm. and who, in his own right, as I said at the start of this, is a legend.